I, uh, my name is Phil Barnes. Uh, there's, there's about 100 frequent flyers for American Airlines named Phil Barnes. So my wife gave me the good advice to publish my work as J. Philip Barnes. <clears throat> uh, today, manned electric aircraft, or more correctly, inhabited electric aircraft, are occupying the skies for more than an hour. And it's only a matter of time before battery or uh, the energy, specific energy of, of batteries, whether they take the form of chemical, nuclear, nano, or some other uh, out, uh, way out method, will support faster and uh, larger all-electric aircraft. Uh, this presentation will focus on uh, some recent discoveries about the efficiency of electric aircraft. And uh, we will apply those principles to both of these aircraft, one flying, the, the lower one flying slowly with today's technology, and the other one flying faster with tomorrow's technology. Uh, both will incorporate advanced mini-blade, low-speed, high-torque rotors, which dovetails very nicely with Dave, uh, David Kelly's presentation yesterday, high-torque, low-RPM. And both will employ optimized uh, electrical power architecture. And both will incorporate regeneration, where the, uh, where the propeller incorporates symmetric sections and provides regeneration uh, of, of power back into the battery. The, uh, the slower aircraft in various scenarios, which we will show, and the faster aircraft, at least in final descent. And by the way, everything here is uh, will be available. It's not ready, hasn't been posted yet at my website, but it will be a couple of weeks from now. It should be ready for you to download, if you like, from my website, howfliesthealbatross.com. And the charter of that website is to delay the extinction of the wandering albatross. OK, um, we will visit along the way the, the visionary, some of the visionaries of electric flight. Um, and I don't have a display down here, Justin, on this screen. So um, OK, and then we have, uh, we'll talk about um, some, one way to get some free energy from the atmosphere, uh, wind prop aerodynamics a little bit about the motor generator and power conditioning, optimization of the, of the motor and battery as a system, and finish up, if we have time, with uh, what I call the 10x future. So we have at least one video in the presentation for the slower aircraft. If we have time, we'll show the video that we showed last night for the faster aircraft. OK, the visionaries included, of course, um, Michael Faraday, who was the inventor of the world with uh, little or no formal education, was inventor of the world's first electric motor. Um, he was one of the greatest scientific discoverers of all time. And Einstein had three portraits on the wall of his office, and one of those three portraits uh, was that of uh, Michael Faraday. We have another uh, 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 major contributor is, is uh, Herman Glauert, who uh, um, was a, wrote a classic textbook on aerodynamics around 1926. And just before his untimely death uh, by walking too close to a, a tree, trump, tree stump dynamite explosion, had begun investigating the aerodynamics of propellers and helicopters. And uh, his many contributions are very many, including the parental glower transformation. It will show a ridge lift soaring analysis uh, in a minute. And he is the father of the concept of the airborne wind turbine, so that the propeller is used as a propeller, but then when we encounter an opportunity, an updraft or final descent, whatever, we can use the propeller as a turbine to put uh, energy back into the aircraft. OK, another visionary, Paul McCready. Of course, Paul, we all know that Paul McCready brought us um, human-powered flight. And uh, he uh, also uh, authored a seminal paper introducing the concept of regenerative electric flight around 1999 vintage. And that was where the, where the first. Uh, suggestion of using, uh, uh, describing a notional mission, complete mission, uh, describing uh, the use of the propeller to, for takeoff and then using the propeller as a turbine uh, when opportunity has arise for regeneration. And so um, my paper of, two, my SAE paper of 2006 was the first attempt to show the feasibility uh, of his concept. And I have written a series of papers, each one uh, more accurate and each one uh, continuing to confirm the, f the feasibility of his concept. OK, let's go straight to some vehicle performance. Since we have a very short period of time for these presentations, and here we have uh, a, uh, the regen flying in ridge lift, where the updraft matches the sink rate of the aircraft, including the effects of regeneration. As you saw from yesterday's presentations, you have a basic sink rate of a clean airplane. And if the airplane is also regenerating, uh, you, you're, you're, you're generating, in, in effect, a drag increment to, uh, to pay the price of, of putting energy back into the battery. 
as was outlined in my SAE paper, um, you've, there's a basic formula for the rate of change of total specific energy. This is a rate of change called DZDT. Rate of change, it's kind of a feet per second or meters per second, rate of change of total stored and kinetic and potential energy per unit weight. And it has major, very simple ingredients. And we can call that the total climb, which can be negative if, uh, in some cases. It uh, begins with the updraft. So we have a certain updraft at the, on this, at the, at this, coming up this cliff, for example. And then we have minus the clean sink rate. This clean sink rate of the airplane is, is a load factor in, which is, which is normally one. But if you're pulling Gs, it's more than one. But in normally, the normal load factor is one. Drag to lift ratio. And then we have this term over here, which is the improp, wind prop effect. And epsilon is just an exchange ratio. This is described in my paper, but the exchange ratio is nothing more than uh, the, the efficiency of the complete powertrain, or the inverse of the efficiency, depending on uh, which mode we're in. And so you can see that the, the total rate of change of, of, of energy will depend on the updraft minus the clean sink rate, which is factored by a term representing the effect of the wind prop, which may be producing thrust or may be producing drag. And that becomes, then that whole group over there becomes the total sink rate. I'll let you uh, take a photograph of my wonderful chart here. This happens to be New Mexico, very close to Abiquiu and, and, and Santa Fe. OK. Um, oh, here's some typical numbers now. Thrust to drag ratio and climb 5 to 1, 5.1. Uh, cruising, of course, thrust to drag ratio is 1. Uh, with the pinwheeling, uh, where, the, where, the, where, where we're talking about using symmetric sections, and the, but the pinwheeling drag is actually surprisingly quite small. Uh, minus 0.1 for the thrust to drag ratio, and then if we're regenerating, a typical number might be one point, minus 1.8. So in other words, uh, the drag is increased by 80% uh, for a representative amount of regeneration. And, and last but not least, uh, steep final descent. A lot of, a lot of uh, pilots like to have steep final descent coming in to, because they're, they've got a short run, uh, runway to deal with. And so you can use the regeneration to get, kill two birds with one stone, put energy back into the battery, and steepen the descent. OK, here's an example of getting some free energy from the atmosphere. Here's a profile of various wind speeds taken for wind. This, was taken, this data is taken for uh, wind turbines terrestrial wind turbines, but it can certainly be applied in our case. And let's take a, take, take a typical number of about high probability density happening around six meters per second as a, as a typical wind speed. So let's uh, have that wind speed approaching a, uh, this is a mathematical model of different densities. And here we have an analysis done by Herman Glauert in his 1926 text of uh, uh, soaring in ridge lift. And what he did was he, 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 uh, he used potential flow, which uses the stream function, and he calculated the shape of the streamlines for the wind coming up, up the slope. And if we start with our six meter per second typical wind speed that we talked about in a previous chart, Glauert showed uh, that uh, if you, that you can soar steady state in, uh, within this bigger circle if you have 30% of that uh, uh, wind speed and you can soar within this smaller circle closer to the, hill, uh, the uh, uh, hill or closer to the cliff if you have 50% of that speed. And those numbers are, are all within the, the right range for this kind of an airplane. So the discovery here is that if you want to regen, a, a really an, act, act, an airplane that actively regenerates, it's going to have to be a floater. And so in effect, it becomes a sailplane that has been equipped with uh, the electrical power architecture. And that leads to the 600 kilogram number that we, that we was talked about yesterday. Because uh, the basic sailplane might be 500 kilograms, 450 kilograms. We need to get up to 600 kilograms to, to, uh, to be able to accommodate the electrical architecture. OK, wind prop. Um, if we have a, uh, a, a section of a blade here, and the, uh, with a specific uh, certain rotational speed, a flight velocity and rotational speed, we can have zero angle of attack on the blade. This is kind of a pinwheeling condition. And uh, if we twist a very, very specific twist, R10 beta equals constant, um, gives us that same condition from hub to tip. And so this is a pinwheeling condition. The rotor is spinning. Every section has zero angle of attack, and the drag penalty on the airplane is actually quite small. Of course, the device is doing neither. It's not providing thrust. It's not providing uh, uh, um, regeneration. OK, so if we now increase the rotational speed, omega r, uh, we, oh, excuse me, increasing the ro rotational speed, we get uh, propeller operation. And if we decrease the rotational speed, that's the omega r, we get turbine operation. 
And as long as we've chosen symmetrical sections, we can get very, very comparable performance in both modes, contrary to, uh, what, uh, contrary to outla uh, outright statements that I have heard from other engineers, absolutely impossible to use a propeller as a turbine. Uh, your efficiency will be completely disastrous, uh, all basically uh, unsupported statements. So let's take a look now at uh, its actual detailed performance uh, comparing these. Here's the two wind props of the same, same thrust and same diameter. And this particular computer model uh, integrates the effect of helical vortices. It's a lifting line analysis. It's a fairly sophisticated calculation. Uh, and we're going to compare these two. These two rotors have the same diameter, the same thrust. The lower one is a two-blade machine spinning at very high rate, and the upper one is slow way, way, slowed way down and operating with high torque. Both have the same diameter. Both have the same thrust. And here we have a plot of efficiency versus what's called a speed ratio. And to the left of the speed ratio of 1 is propeller operation. And to the right of speed ratio 1 is turbine operation. And you'll notice that the efficiencies are about the same for both rotors uh, in the 83% range, whether we're operating as propeller or turbine. Again, this is essential to use symmetric sections. Here's a plot of the force coefficient. Of course, in the propeller regime, we get, we're developing force, a positive force. And in the turbine regime, we're generating a, uh, a negative force. And it turns out that the eight-blade uh, machine happens to have uh, a slight advantage. So the statement, the outright statement that eight blades are less efficient than two is fundamentally wrong. And I invite those of you who would like to further study further that can, can, to check out my papers, uh, to uh, check, out, check that out. OK. So here we have actually a more detailed calculation. Here we, we were iterating the vortices of, of, the, of, the, of the wake. And we're plotting the efficiency, the torque loading, et cetera, and the induced velocities of the propeller. This particular plot is for the propeller operation. And now let's watch what happens when we go to turbine operation and take a look at the efficiencies, 82%. And now the, uh, the torque, of course, changes sign. Um, the efficiencies, Glowert section efficiency remains high. And uh, so the bottom line is, is that the, as it, we flip the torque from positive to negative, the efficiency remains right around 83% for both modes. OK, motor generator and power conditioning. Uh, as we all know, we're, we're, we preferred architecture today is to use a, a permanent magnet type machine, which, which um, uh, uh, operating together with, a rec with, a, with an inverter, which we will show shortly, can operate as a rectifier for regeneration for free. If you combine the, the, the motor together with its inverter rectifier as a package, uh, it behaves and, and can be quantified the same way as a classic DC motor. Notice that uh, we have two wire interface over here with the, with the battery. And the motor that we like to use today has had three wires. And so that the inverter rectifier is converting the two wire DC power into a three wire, uh, three phase power for, for, the, for the machine. Torque proportional to current. And because we're a little bit short on time here, the, what we did was on, on, the, on the previous chart, uh, we know the torque is proportional to current. And so the ideal efficiency is, uh, turns out to be proportional to the rotational speed. And the ideal generator efficiency, inversely proportional to rotational speed. And so we could check that with test data here. And there we know we're matching the data. The, the blue, dashed blue lines are the theoretical uh, statement of the previous chart. And the data is following those characteristics, that prediction except up in the corner, of course, where the, where the parasitic losses are high. So here, at the, at his, once again, we have a speed ratio of 1, below which we have uh, motor operation. And above speed ratio of 1, we have generator operation. So this, this plot nicely dovetails with the wind prop performance that we plot that we showed just a second ago. The higher efficiency machines, of course, will just penetrate more deeply into this theoretical corner. Here, the theoretical number goes all the way up to efficiency of unity and then drops instantly to zero at a speed ratio of one. The real data is, is forming a curve that's penetrating deeper and deeper into that corner as the efficiency of the machine increases. And I have heard of uh, some machines being developed today which have 97, 98% efficiency uh, may be coming soon. OK, um, <clears throat> this is the typical six-pack rectifier, and we activate the, uh, basically have six transistors that are, that, are, that are basically operated in alternating diagonal pairs to energize and create three-phase power for the motor. And um, turns out that uh, the, uh, each of those uh, transistors happens to incorporate a flyback diode because you can't just turn current on and off without uh, uh, dissipating the energy. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of arcing. 
And uh, the Toyota uh, Prius today uh, is suffering <laughs> excessive irking. How many people driving a Toyota Prius? Okay, we've heard about several cases where the Toyota Prius suddenly lost power. And, uh, and apparently the driver is kind of almost thrown forward in their seatbelt. The car comes fr instantly goes from 70 miles an hour down to 15 miles an hour in the fast lane and has to cut, for, cut across four lanes of traffic. And so Toyota has, uh, has been on the hook to fix this problem, but apparently it's been known for over a decade. So you can't overload your transistors. You can't just putting on 500 volts. 500 volts is a very typical number, and that, that is being switched on and off at a very high frequency, thousands of hertz. And uh, you have to do that right. You have to provide adequate cooling. But anyway, assuming that we do the adequate cooling and, and the properly sized our transistors, we get for free uh, regeneration because these flyback diodes, you'll notice, are all kind of pointing up. And so uh, what we get from this kind of a situation is we get a, a, a series of three phases, uh, three ways, waves, and the overall, uh, the overall result is a, with a very slight amount of ripple is a steady current fl uh, flowing back into the battery. So we got the regeneration from free from the flyback diodes that were in the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, electrical power control. OK, so let's talk about optimization now. If we take a look at the, uh, uh, whether, we, whether we have one motor or two or, or several hooked up to a battery, uh, we can model the system as having a, a, uh, a battery resistance and a, uh, a system resistance, uh, motor resistance, and we'll put those together, and uh, here's a sort of a system that I'm not going to spend too much time on here, but you, because you can create a series of, of non-dimensional numbers characterizing the performance of the system. And um, torque versus speed, uh, linear, and uh, efficiency versus speed. And the idea here is that we would, we would like to operate right here on this peak efficiency. And it turns out, and here's the application of, of, of test data for an actual motor generator, taking all those non-dimensional number numbers and condensing them to uh, a uh, condensed type package of curves. And uh, so it turns out now that if we um, uh, take a look at the basic uh, principles of trying to optimize this, it turns out that you can, you can study this if you're interested later. Uh, it turns out that, that we're driven to a unique battery EMF Remember to distinguish battery EMF from battery voltage because EMF is the basic no load voltage. The terminal voltage is, is going to include resistance, internal resistance losses. But it turns out that the system, if you put these together, you can solve for the combination of battery EMF and motor current and, and, and uh, that will give us the optimum value for K, which is the, the uh, uh, torque constant or current of, of the motor generator or the equivalent K, or the KV if you prefer to work with KV. Uh, so all those can be optimized to allow us to operate right here on this, uh, on this opt optimal efficiency point. There's some, there's some typical numbers for resistance. Okay, so now we're, uh, we're at the point of applying this information, and we're going to apply it to what I call Coulomb, who I've called Coulomb Keeper. That's a silly name, but it's a functional name because this aircraft is very, very frugal with the way that it stores and expends electrical charge. Okay. Um, high torque, low speed. This is basically a sailplane type airplane that's been equipped with electrical power architecture capable of regeneration. And, uh, and this is a big eye chart, but I want, the thing that I really want you to look at is that for various modes, uh, take a look at these efficiency numbers. Um, the efficiency of the system. This is a system efficiency number, okay? 74% um, in uh, loiter, 76% in cruise, 73% in Regen and 71% thermaling and 84% in final descent. So the bottom line is that we talked, some, one of the presentations yesterday talked about the efficiency. Okay, you said you thought the efficiency of 85% might be a, bit, a little bit high. Yes. 75. Okay, I'll try to be a little bit more accurate next time. Okay, so, uh, and, and this is all depending upon using a DC voltage converter. We start with maybe, maybe a 500 volt battery. But we, but we want to trim that down to 200, 300 volts, for depending on, on what regime that we're, that we're flying in. OK. And uh, so let's, sh let's show the video, and I hope let's, let's of the uh, Coulomb Keeper. I, and I think if I could do this correctly, we'll have time to show both videos. Um, the model for Coulomb Keeper is mathematically modeled with, this is one of my specialties, is mathematically modeling the entire aircraft, including the rotor blades, with equations in Python in Blender, which is a, which is a European uh, computer graphics package, which is all done in English. 
I highly recommend it, and it's free. So if those of you who like computer graphics, uh, and particularly free computer graphics and highly capable, take a look at blender.org. Okay, so I, I provided this model to, uh, to my associate, Mario Marino, who did the animation. So let's take a look. Whoops. So that's after my conclusion. So this is my concluding chart. Uh, the bottom line conclusion that I want you to see of all this whole page here is that a region is coming soon to an airport near you. Okay, let's take a look at, the, at a video. This is Mario's edition. He added a few seconds of this. I didn't, turn, I didn't delete it. Okay, now we're starting up. The airplane is designed so that a single person can handle it without any assistance from anybody else. So the winglets point down toward the ground, although they clear the ground. <clears throat> They're only there to prevent the airplane from tipping in a, in a wind. The tail actually touches the ground during roll, and now it lifts off as we get faster and faster. So you see the tail is lifted off. We're still rolling on the nose wheel. And now we're lifting off. And you can see this thing is a floater. It's flying very slowly. All of this regeneration uh, it cannot really be done with a high wing loading. I went around and around with Mario on where to put the observer. What's happening here is you put, now we're regenerating now on the cliff, a flying along the cliff, constant altitude flight, the updraft matches. Now we're doing thermaling, and uh, here the updraft ex um, uh, is powerful enough to keep the air, to actually take the aircraft aloft while it's regenerating. Of course, it would go up faster if it were if it were not regenerating, but it could still go up and regenerate. Now we're coming in for a landing. So that was quite a rewarding experience for me to. Uh, to be able to have, uh, to see the, the, my design um, animated like that. It was really cool, because I don't know how to do that animation. Okay, um, let's go to the next one now. I think we have just enough time to show. Okay, this aircraft has been named Faraday first in honor of Michael Faraday, notionally the first airplane to reach Mach points, first all electric to fly at Mach 7, which is the same speed flown today by the Airbus A400M. It would be cool to, uh, to take our all-electric aircraft and, and fly up beside an A400M and wave at, the wave at the crew and then advance the throttle. That would be really cool. Okay, now we're gonna be doing a flight control check. This airplane has a very unique flight control scheme with variable winglet toe. So the winglets have variable symmetric or differential winglet toe. Watch, the, we're doing a pre-flight checkout right here. And we're ready to go. Advance the throttle. Kind of rotating, uh, very, very low speed. The, the, these uh, rotors are spinning at only 500 RPM. And the, the reason for that is to keep the Mach number uh, low for the, for the rotor blades. Here we are returning. We're, we use the differential uh, uh, winglet toe to, do a, to, turn the, to bank the aircraft. Banking back down again. Here we're showing that we're flying a little bit slower than a commercial airplane, which flies at about Mach 0.8. And now we're coming in for a landing. And Mario added the, uh, the landing gear. I wasn't smart enough to do all that, so he added all those details <coughs> with a nice little touch, bouncy touchdown here. So that's the conclusion of Faraday first. Okay, that's a conclusive presentation. Have a couple of minutes if anybody has any, any questions. Um, uh, I will be loading these onto my uh, website probably, t I would say, two weeks from now. They'll be available. You can go to my website anytime, howfliesthealbatross.com, to, to, to see preliminary versions and particularly to check out the simulation of the wandering albatross, dynamic soaring. Brian. If you were to uh, try to do regeneration with an ordinary propeller, that is one that is not a symmetrical airfoil, it would not perform as well during the regeneration. Do you have any idea how big a degradation would occur uh, the when, question not, is, when not using a symmetrical airfoil? 
Uh, Brian's question is, is what would be the performance penalty of trying to use a cambered uh, airfoil for optimized for propeller operation, trying to use that as a turbine? <clears throat> I have not run those calculations, but I, would, I will do this with my hand. I will say that I'm trying to use an inverted uh, uh, airfoil to develop lift, and so I would expect the efficiency to be quite low. I do not have an actual number for that. I just arbitrarily, if you will, assumed that it would be unsuitable, and so I went with symmetric sections. The penalty is very, very small. Okay, uh, Tyler. Yeah, uh, yesterday, Greg was showing us um, um, regeneration with a high-wing loading aircraft, and you were just talking about how um, you require a low-wing wing loading aircraft. Um, any comment on the different philosophies there? Okay, the, the, well, okay, I, maybe I, I didn't make that a little bit confusing, Tyler. The, the faster airplane does regenerate, but really pretty much in, in the final descent. Okay, the, uh, the, the, the faster airplane is not going to be able to go up in the thermal like we saw. It's not going to be able to stay at constant altitude in ridge lift because it, its sink rate is, is higher than the, the prevailing uh, updraft. Okay, so it has to, the prevailing updraft that we get available to work with is something like five meters per second. That's what we get to work with. And so uh, the, the faster airplane would not have the right wing loading for that. So the slower airplane can regenerate in many, many scenarios. The faster airplane regenerate pretty much only on final descent. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Thanks. Okay, that gives us plenty of time for the next speaker. Thank you very much.